Welcome to part two of our parabolic SAR indicator series. In part one, we spent some time taking a look at what's underneath the hood to better understand how the parabolic SAR plots, when the dots plot, when we see the dots reverse, and what goes on behind the scenes into making this indicator actually function. Now in this video, we're going to use all of that knowledge and we're going to move forward with making the indicator better. What I mean by better is we're going to be adding in a predictive pattern that helps us identify early entries inside of the parabolic SAR. These early entries will be useful to identify moments before that reversal actually takes place and those dots flip from one side, say under price, to above price. I'll show you an example of the indicator that we're going to be building in just a second. Here's the agenda that I have for this entire video in case you'd like to jump around. For those of you that like to code, that's what most of this video is going to be spent on. First, I'll break down what is this quote unquote hidden pattern. It's not really hidden when I tell you what it is. It'll make sense through just common sense and logic. After we talk about the pattern, we'll move on to coding the pattern, turning that entire visual observation into something that's codified into buy and sell signals. Once we code the pattern, we'll then apply it on our charts to compare the basic parabolic SAR indicator, the built-in version in Thinkorswim, to now our new version, which has not only the color coding, but also the smarter logic, which we'll plot out as both arrows and chart bubbles. In our next video, we'll take these buy and sell signals and we'll turn them into a scan so we have a complete picture here, a way to find where these moments are happening and a way to actually see these moments on our chart so you can go back and study previous opportunities. Now let's get started with first discussing what is this quote unquote hidden pattern. Now this pattern, if you remember, all stems from that acceleration factor and acceleration limit variable that we had. If you go back to the analogy we created, the acceleration factor or ACC was the speed of our car. It was the ability to control the speed and increase the speed. The limit was the max potential speed we had, which if you remember was set to 0.2 and 0.02 for ACC. And we saw how our speed fluctuated over time. Now for this particular pattern, this is my hypothesis. What happens when all of the following is true? What happens when we have hit our max speed, so that acceleration variable has increased over time, and now we've hit the limit, that point two, we can no longer go any further. Now, all that can happen is the speed can be reset when the dots flip. So what happens if A, we've hit our max speed, B, we're starting to lose momentum and we're seeing that momentum being lost through some overbought, oversold signs. That's the question that I'm looking to answer in today's video. And when we code up this pattern a way that we can understand it, here's what we're left with. The indicator that we'll build will plot this yellow arrow that you see. And notice how it's plotting this when that parabolic SAR dots are still underneath price action, we're in that quote unquote state dot long. This is one bar before we're actually seeing that state flip. So it's an early sign expecting for the state to flip. And if we take a look at that speed down here, you can see how it's gradually increased. We started at that 0 0.02, we've increased to 0 0.14, 0 0.16, 0 0.18, and now that speed has been maintained at the max speed and all that can happen is the speed can be reset. So this is the pattern that I'm looking to take advantage of. And as we go through this video, you should ask yourself the same question of, is this a good early entry signal of the parabolic SAR dots reversing in the opposite direction? Can we treat this as that early sign? This is the pattern. Now inside of our code, I'm going to remove this lower panel indicator. And let's start by opening up where we left off in our previous video, where all we had done was change the color so the colors were a little bit more readable. Now, the first thing that I'm going to do is add in two new input variables that I know that we're going to need as we go through this video. The first input variable is going to be around the plot method. Now, for this particular pattern that we're going to be coding, 
I want to give you two, or rather, I want to give the user two different options to choose from with regards to how they want to see this on their charts. We'll say they can choose between arrows or chart bubbles. If you're like me and you have a lot of indicators that already plot arrows, you may actually prefer the chart bubbles approach. And that's why I want to make this an optionality that the user can select. And it also gives you an idea of how you can go about adding some of these fancy quote unquote bells and whistles into your existing indicators. Now, the second option that I'm also going to add is if the user does select arrows, then I want the user to be able to change the arrow thickness. And this is just another practice of how to use these switch variables. That's the only reason we're adding this in. And I'll say one, two, three, four, and five are your different options available for the user to select. Now, if I simply click apply and okay, and we open up this indicator, now what we have in our study settings menu are two additional input fields that we've added. The first is that plot method, which allows you to select between arrows and chart bubbles. And the second is the thickness, which allows you to choose between one, two, three, four, and five. Now, as of right now, if I were to select something, nothing actually changes. These aren't connected anymore. To connect them, let's go ahead and add in some code, which we can use to use later down as we actually start writing some of the logic. Let's start with the plot method first, and there I'll create a new variable called plot choice. And this is the variable which will track what has the user selected, arrows or chart bubbles. We can't add any of the formatting code inside of if else statements. So this is a way to bypass that thinkorswim restriction. Here I'll say switch, feed in that plot method switch function. And let's open this up and I'll add in the closing bracket. And we have two cases. The first case is arrows and our second case is chart bubbles. And inside of arrows, if we take plot choice and we set that equal to one, and in chart bubbles, let's set that equal to two, and we can use this as a simple key. So if plot choice is equal to one, then the user has selected arrows. If plot choice is equal to two, then the user has selected chart bubbles. And we can add that little comment in just so it's nice and clear what's going on. Now, the next thing we can do is repeat the same idea, but for our arrow thickness. So there I can say def arrow weight. And here we can repeat the same switch functions where I'll take in our arrow thickness input variable, feed that in, open up the switch function, and I'll add in each one of our five cases and I'll copy paste this just so it's a little faster and there I'll say three four and five now similar to what we did we need to set arrow weight equal to each of these values and the reason we're doing this is so when we get to actually creating these arrows instead of defining a manual width we can actually let this be user selected a little bit more dynamic which allows us to be more prepared and ready to go. And there we have it. So now we have our two different input variables connected to switches with variables that carry forward the logic based off of what the user selected. Plot choice is equal to one if the user select arrows or two if the user selects chart bubbles. And based on whatever width the user selects here, that value is carried forward as a numerical value inside of arrow weight. Now, if we come all the way down towards the bottom, we can start writing the logic to turn our pattern into some actual code with some concrete logic. The first thing we said was we wanted to see our speed, our current speed equal to the max speed. The way we can add in this condition is by saying def max speed reached. And here, what we can do is simply add in the condition ACC is equal to our acceleration limit. As long as we connect these to the variables, that allows us to be dynamic. So if, say, you wanted to change this point two to something else, that will automatically change for all of these conditions compared to hard coding in this value. So this is that first check that we were looking for. 
Now, the second thing we wanted to see was price to be losing momentum and for us to be seeing some overbought and oversold signs. Now, here we can use the most classic overbought, oversold indicator, which is the RSI. And we can use the built-in up and down signals as our cues for when, say, we might see these reversals. So there I'll add in some code which says up signal. And all this is doing is looking at the RSI indicator and there checking if we see the up signal on the current bar. And I'll add in one more variable for the down signal. And here we'll reverse this for the RSI to be checking for the down signal. Now using this, we can start to add in our code for the actual buy and sell signal. So here I'll say def, uh, and let's call this uptrend exhausting. And we'll say the uptrend is exhausting if we have reached the max speed. So max speed reached is true. And we're seeing a down signal. If both of these are true, then we would like this variable to return one. Otherwise, we'd like this variable to return zero. Now let's see what this is outputting with chart bubbles first. And here we can say add chart bubbles. And we can make use of that plot choice variable we had written right up above, where we can now say plot choice is equal to two. And the reason we check if it's equal to two, two is the code for the chart bubbles, the condition where we carry that variable forward. So I'll say plot choice is equal to two, and we can see this uptrend exhausting. If that is the case, then I'd like to see this chart bubble plot at the closing price. And here I'll say likely downtrend, and let's add this on a second line, parabolic reversal, and I'll add the color of color.light red, since here we're saying our uptrend has exhausted. And this should be add chart bubble, not bubbles. And that should now compile. Now, if I click apply and OK on our charts, we should see nothing so far because, and let me get rid of all of these Fibonacci levels really quickly. We should see nothing because we've selected arrows here. So if we now select, uh, change this from arrows to chart bubbles and I click apply, we can now see chart bubbles where we expect this likely reversal to take place. And this is ahead of, again, the parabolic SAR dots flipping. So we have that uptrend exhaustion in place. Now let's repeat the same process for the downtrend exhaustion. And then we'll add in some arrows. So I'm going to copy paste this code and I'll say downtrend exhausting. And here we're still looking for our max speed to have been reached but this time we'll look for the up signal. Now our plot choice for our chart bubble still needs to be two, which tells us that the user wants to see chart bubbles, not arrows. But for our second condition, we change that to downtrend exhausting. We can plot this still at the closing price. And we'll say here, likely uptrend reversal incoming, or, um, well, or uh, parabolic SAR reversal. Let's change our color here from light red to light green. And now if I click apply and OK, we should be able to see both the bearish and the bullish heads up signs of these incoming reversals. Now let's add in the functionality to see this as arrows as well. To do that, we can add in one new plot variable here, which we can call our plot variable for the uptrend exhausting to be uh, cell signal, cell signal. And there we can say sell signal is simply equal to uptrend exhausting and plot choice is equal to one and uptrend exhausting. We can also set in how we'd like to see this painting strategy and we'll say painting strategy dot boolean arrow down since this is a sell signal. And we can also add in set line width and plug in the arrow width that we had, or I think it was arrow weight. And this should be set line weight. And that should now compile. And we can repeat the same thing for our buy signal. And there we'll say plot choice is equal to one and downtrend exhausting. 
And here we can say by signal dot set painting strategy painting strategy dot boolean arrow up this time. And we can connect our set line weight to the arrow weight. Now if I click apply and OK and we go from chart bubbles to say arrows. Now we can see arrows where we have the weight of three automatically set. And if we want to say change this weight from three to maybe four, you'll see how the arrows automatically get bigger. So that's just a neat little way to let the user control a little bit more instead of needing to go inside of the plots menu and change the weight there. One other thing we can add are some colors. So here we can say by signal dot set default color. And we can set this equal to color dot cyan or color dot light green rather to match our chart bubbles. And let's set cell signal to set default color. And there we'll change this to color dot light red to match our chart bubbles here as well. Now that we've built the indicator, let's evaluate how good these signals look. Inside of the SPY ETF on a daily time frame, we can see that there's some really nice signals and there's also some false breakouts. There's some medium tier signals as well. And for volatility box members, in future videos, we'll build a pro version of this indicator, which helps us filter out some of these false breakouts by making use of some other patterns, which are again, making use of all of these different acceleration factors, different price clues as well, and bringing all of that information together. Now we looked at this on the daily time frame. What happens if we come into SPY on a one minute time frame chart? Now on that one minute time frame chart, you'll see we don't see too many signals. We've just seen one, at least in the past two days. If we come into the five minute time frame chart, a few more signals, some in after hours activity, a few bull, a few bear. If we come into the 15 minute time frame chart, you can start to see some more signals plotting. And for those of you that are swing traders, you might find this to be a little bit more up your alley. And same thing with the 30 minute, where you're starting to see more occurrences of these arrows as you look at this over a period of time. Now, of course, these aren't all that frequent where if you looked at only the S&P 500, there would be a lot of times where you might just be waiting. Well, that's where in our next video, we're going to build a scan which allows you to find all of the places in which these arrows are printing, both the buy and the sell signals. You'll see how we can leverage the code that we wrote in today's video and very easily turn this into a scan which allows us to not go digging for setups, but rather let Thinkorswim do the heavy lifting and give us a nice clean list that we can evaluate further. I'll see you in part three of this video series in which we'll build the bullish and bearish scans. Take care, everyone.